Hello and welcome to episode 76 of the Casual Try Hard Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm James. And you can see us. Yeah, in Technicolor. Yes, we, we have decided <laughs> to uh, do this episode like every meeting in class you've taken since March <laughs> via, Sorry about that. Zo- via Zoom. So yeah. if you're having flashbacks to, I don't know, seeing your boss with no pants on, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, How'd you know I wasn't wearing pants? <laughs> I, I just assumed. I just assumed. I did put a shirt on, though, yes. unlike last night. <laughs> yeah, we, we, were, we were testing it. We just, just like, he was either in a tube top or shirtless. I just saw, like, bare <laughs> shoulders. So I was assuming he was shirtless. You got to shirtless. see my lung sweaters, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, that's an image that's stuck in your head now. Yes. yes. <laughs> so we're going to do it this way. Uh, we have slides for everything to kind of talk through mm-hmm. all the cards so we could do our normal like video uh, set preview. Juan, the uh, friend of ours that normally does our preset video stuff was super tied up this week. They had a prior engagement, some online convention or something. Yeah. So, unfortunately, he couldn't help us out, but uh, we're assuming you guys like the video episode, so we're going we're gonna to put one out anyway. It'll be on our YouTube channel if, you want, if you're listening to us and want to check it, check it out there. Yeah, that's uh, just search casual try hard yep. MTG M- on, yep. on YouTube, and we will pop up. Yep. We will assume that I put music in this and everything, that it was <laughs> semi-professional. So, if you want to tweet at us about what you're excited about for Core 21... Uh, you can get at us at Casual Tripod on Twitter. Yep. You can hit us up on Facebook, at Casual Tryhard MTG. You can either post on our page, shoot us a message, whatever you want to do. If you want to get us through email, it's show at casualtryhardmtg.com. I check our email all the time. So don't hesitate to drop us one. I think that's how most people are like interacting, although that's kind of died off a little bit now that we have our Discord server. Yeah, we do Which, get some people yeah. talking in the Discord. Yeah, so you can check us out there. It's Casual Tryhard MTG. There's a link on our Twitter, a link on our Facebook. There's a link in the description. If you can't find a link, you can hit me up on email or Facebook or whatever, and I will send you a personal invite. There you go. We also have a TCG affiliate link. If you want to help support the show a little bit, maybe pre-order some of these sweet Core 21 cards. It's tcg.casualtryhardmtg.com. After you follow that link, we will get a very small sliver of whatever you decide to purchase. Helps just a taste. Going. Yeah, just just a, taste. a taste. If you want to support us a little bit more directly, you can do that at patreon.com slash casual tryhard MTG. We don't have too many Patreon perks. We're still kind of feeling things out a little bit, but we do have a Patreon only finance room in our Discord server where we talk about specs and that sorts of thing. And we also do a little bit of pre-show that's posted up on our Patreon. Um, That's not posted anywhere else. You have to be a Patreon to check that out. And it's only on the Patreon page. Yes. So this week it'll be a little video. Mm -hmm. So you get that to look forward to. So we're going to go through the mechanics. Not that there are any new like evergreen mechanics or new keywords, but just like, what the gold uncommons are kind of doing or telling you to do in limited and to give you an idea of what some of the cards want to do mm-hmm. just in general that might show up in constructed. Yeah. Some of the pros refer to these as signpost uncommons and they are ever present. Every set has normally a cycle of uncommon gold cards for each color pair or each color, or whatever they're trying to convey in the set. And you can kind of look at them and tell what direction like you're going to be building that deck in. Yeah. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. Go let us. Some of these are pretty straightforward. Some of them um, are kind of reaching a little bit. So bear with us as we work through these for you. Yeah. Look at this graphics department we got going here. Yeah. All right. And so first up we have green white, uh, which is the plus one plus one counters theme. Yeah. We have Conclave Mentor as kind of the card for that. Mm-hmm. And if you remember Aether Revolt, this is kind of just Winding Constrictor yeah, with winding one less toughness. Yeah. Winding Constrictor worked for any counters, right? Worked for 
I guess if a creature or player, right? Was that yeah. the? Yeah. So it worked to increase the amount of energy you got. Yeah, but it was specifically any counter, not just plus one plus one counters. So it worked for energy. It worked for neg one neg one counters. Okay. Yeah. I guess it would work for keyword counters for my Coria. You get two. Ooh. Ooh. But for the most part, Winding Constrictor is just used for plus one plus one counters and like for the most part, yeah. In in constructed. Mm-hmm. Um this this card could have a home if the green black decks wanted to be green white, but mm-hmm. the fact that it's a two two just makes it that much more vulnerable to like shock. Yeah. And wild slash in older formats. Yep. Which kind of hurts it, but I don't know what you would get other than better sideboard cards. Going white, you mean? Going white over black. Well, you'd get one more plus one plus one counter. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they, I don't know if people like this is a card that you could see like people could try being Abzon in yeah. those in this plus one plus one counter decks to have eight of this or twelve if you count hardened scales, right? Of this effect, but this is what white and green decks are trying to do: is mm-hmm. put counters on things. Yep. So next we have red black yep and surprise surprise it's another set with red black sacrifice being the theme for the red black decks imagine that yeah we've had a whole bunch of them lately this one doesn't seem too egregious for constructed um no the sacrifice decks have been a little bit out of control like they they certainly have spikes where they're really good um this one i don't think is constructed playable but maybe it'll surprise me no, it's, like, uh, no, go ahead. I was gonna say the the fact that it's like plus two, plus two in trample. Like I feel like yeah. there's been a lot of like things similar to this mm-hmm. that don't see play. Yeah, was it a Fireblade Artisan in Allegiance that saw um, a little bit of play and was kind of similar to this? But well, Slaughter Priest of Mogus is a, a two two that is for red black. That when you sack something, it gets plus two plus zero. Oh. Yeah, the, uh, the fire blade has haste and yeah. does two damage instead. Yeah, when you sacrifice something, but it yeah. lets you sack something on your upkeep or sack a creature on your upkeep. Uh, sack a creature on your upkeep, I yeah. think. Yeah. So I don't know if this is going to be something that's going to see play. Yeah. And I didn't see any like really pushed sacrifice cards in the rest of the set. Yeah, I didn't either. So if you want to play red, black, or gen sacrifice, you're probably just stuck with the deck you have. Mm-hmm. Which is fine. That deck's yep. plenty good by itself. So experimental overlo- overload. Yep, it's the uh, blue-red signpost. Yeah. Yep. And it's going to create an uh, XX blue and red weird creature token. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, it is weird. <laughs> Where X is the number of instants and sorceries in your graveyard, and then you can return an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand, and you exile this. Mm-hmm. So this is similar to, I can't remember the name of it. We talked about it, about it uh, the other week. The card that amassed for oh, one, yeah. red, one red blue. Yep. And amass equal to the number of instants and sorcerers you have in your uh, invade graveyard. Invade the city? Maybe it's invade the city. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yep, something like uh, that. Card saw stone zero play. Right. And yeah, this typically cost- this is a really fun deck for limited environments. It rarely shows up in, I'm not going to say constructed, because there is like, you know, is it spell sling or yeah. like eternal decks, but not really in standard too often. Yeah, and this, and this effect usually doesn't make it into those kind of decks where you right. like use a card to turn like your spent spells into a big body. Mm-hmm. It gets bounced by Teferi. Right. But again, uh, I don't think there were any like egregious blue red spells cards that would like push a constructed deck. Yeah, pro- no, nothing for constructed. I don't think it's so sad. Remember how excited I was for Thousand Year Storm? I was like, this is great, mm-hmm. and that card has seen zero play <laughs> and has gotten like no support. Right, like nothing to even like make the card even like close to playable yeah it's like oh poor buddy (laughs) all right next up a black white life gain card yeah surprise 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 yeah indulging patrician yep 
It's a uh, one white black for a uh, one four flying lifelink. And at the beginning of your end step, if you gain three or more life this turn, each opponent loses three life. I think this is this theme is pretty well supported in the set. Like there's a yeah. mythic or a rare that uh, we're going to talk about later on that, that wants mm-hmm. you to gain life. Mm-hmm. There's actually a couple of them that do. And the like mono white decks currently in standard have a pretty strong life game element to them with the Johnny's Pride Mates and Heliod and Daxos. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if they started splashing black for some of this like ancillary life gain stuff. I don't know um, if this card in particular is strong enough to make it unconstructed, but yeah, like this is always kind of a theme of black white, and mm-hmm. it's rare that it shows up in constructed. Yeah, because you're usually like it's kind of a nickel and dimey kind of thing, or you're going to gain a life and deal a damage, and oftentimes that's not like worth that much. Yeah, yeah. So, like the the one thing that this card does have going for it though is. Like Lightning Helix is a pretty decent sized swing. Yeah. And it's not super hard to gain like three life in a turn. So it's if you not. have like this guy and a healer's hawk and then you play a Daxos, like that's three life. Yeah. Or just um like sacking a food token. Yep. If you yep. make that's food awesome. somehow. Oh, I forgot about food. Yeah. Yeah, so food is three life. There might be something here. But this is usually ends up being like a tier two kind of strategy. Yeah. Leaf can Avenger. Two Not red green for a four three. So we have an Ooh. aggro mana dork. <laughs> Just what you want, right? Just what you want. I want my mana dork to come down on turn four because I'm trying to ramp into six drops. I don't know. Like <laughs> sure. So red green is big monsters. Yeah. If anyone was playing during like Khan's block, this is ferocious. So it cares about things with power four or greater. Yeah. This card in particular is a little bit interesting because like you said, you don't really want your four drops to be your mana dorks, but this can also use its own mana. So it's a mana sink and a mana dork. And if you have big enough things, it's going to tap for three or four mana. Yeah. But on some level, like you're winning the game if you've got like three, four power creatures. Right. Yeah. Ah, cons block a simpler time. (laughs) Some would say the best time. <laughs> yes, some of the best times. All right, sweet. A three drop with no with no power. We're doing it. <laughs> yeah, three mana, zero, three. This is an nice. obsessive stitcher. It's a one blue black for a zero, three human wizard. You can tap it to draw a card, then discard a card. You can pay two blue black, tap it, sacrifice it, return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So the loot effect in limited is really powerful. Yep. I mean, the bringing something back for four is below the rate that the current reanimation spells normally do that. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it's like the tap effect on a creature yeah. makes it so this creature is super vulnerable. Like you might not get to do the reanimation thing. Normally, when you have this stapled onto a creature, though, it's at sorcery speed. Yeah. This isn't. So you can like declare this as a block and then reanimate some big fatty from your graveyard and yeah. then attack with it your next turn. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that, but I was just thinking yeah. more of like trying to get an 04 through the turn cycle. Right, yeah. 03. 03, yeah. 04 be better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is fine. Again, there's nothing in blue and black that are really going to push you towards uh, reanimation in constructed. Yeah, like most of your targets for this are probably going to be around like five or six mana and you end up sinking seven mana into this to do it. So you're not really gaining anything other than maybe a card if you use the loot. Yeah. And I mean, since they're both tap abilities, it really really makes it kind of hard to... So you can loot something into your graveyard and then bring it back. Right. Right. You have to tap it, tap for both. Yeah. When I was going through these, making the show notes also i was trying to like see what other cards were supporting them because some of these aren't super straightforward like obviously this one wants you to like put things in your graveyard and reanimate them but when i was going through the card file there's not a whole lot else that like supports this there's like one five mana reanimation spell yeah but there's no like great payoff yeah 
there's no agent of treachery right to reanimate or something like that yeah so next up is just so leading and so great for <laughs> limited kill something yeah green black play removal spells Woohoo, i'm in yeah this but is a, james the archetype yes twin blade assassins mm-hmm. it's a five four for three green black no, and so it's a you, fire elemental yes in uh, at the beginning of your end step if a creature died this turn draw a card yep so it doesn't say what creature right and I mean, you could sac or how it died. You could sacrifice it. It could be yours. It could be your opponent's. Mm-hmm. But again, five mana, not getting the job done. I don't know. Like Moldervine Reclamation was pretty good and limited. Oh no, in limited, yeah. yeah. But Moldervine Reclamation wasn't limited to one card a turn. Oh, that's true. And this is limited only to your turn, so you can't chump block and get a card. Oh yeah, that's that's also true. Yeah, I mean, the trade off is is this is actually a body. Right. Where a Moldavine Reclamation was like, take turn five, mm-hmm. do nothing. Yeah. Hope to get value later. This is at um, least a body. Yeah. Unlike the last one, though, like there are other cards that care about things dying in the set. And there's some Death Touch things as well, right? That yeah. care about Death Touch. Yep. Yeah. So th- this one m- might be a little bit more well supported than the self mill reanimate thing that we just talked about. Yeah. Hey, we have a blue-white flyers archetype, maybe. I don't believe it. You don't believe it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is blue-white for a 2-2. Two, two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, creature spells with flying that you cast cost one less to cast. Okay. And whatever creature with flying enters the battlefield under your control, your boy here gets uh, plus one, plus one till the end of turn. Yeah. I mean, this thing's pretty good. It's fine. I mean, it's 2-2 two, two flyer for two is at or above rate. Mm-hmm. And the ever-present 3-4 flyer for 5 that scries is pretty good when it only costs 4. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's actually in the set, but it seems like there's always some sort of 3-4 flyer for 5, right? Yeah, I mean, this could be a constructed playable card, Mm -hmm. right? You go, like, for the next three months, you go, like, you know, Healer's Hawk or uh, Spectral Sailor Mm -hmm. into this, into Empyrean Eagle and a 2-drop and, like, a Hushbringer. Yeah. And now you've got this big flying board and you know you're you're trying to rally of wings uh someone at the end of the game. Yep. That uh big angel still in standard too, right? Yeah, the what is it, four white, 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 you tap four flyers and pay a little yeah. bit of mana. Yep. It's still around. Yep. It's in the cube. It's in the cube. It's in the cube. Hey, it's a dog guy. Yeah, I'm, I think red white is dog tribal. Weird. I think that most of the dogs are in red and white. Okay. Um, I think most of them are centered around white, and then some of like Chandra's friends are like elemental dogs or whatever. Okay. And this thing obviously wants you to play dogs. It lets you tutor for dogs and like buffs the number or gets buffed by the number of things that are attacking. And then we have blue green draw a card. Is it just draw a card? I think it's draw two cards. There's a lot of green stuff that triggers for drawing your second card, which is really strange because that was like a blue-red archetype not too long ago. Yeah. I'm like, why does green get to be everything? Yeah, green just does everything. Yeah, no, I I saw that and I was like, why is this the archetype for... Why is this a green card? I don't know. Like like I said, there are a lot of like mono green cards that trigger for on, drawing cards like on your opponent's turn I yeah think, it's like right? hey this this four six becomes a six six trampler yeah if you draw your second card yeah so lore scale scale coaddle is an oldie yeah it's a reprint this used to be stuff that like standard magic was about mm-hmm. you play your thing and then you start like casting ops or brainstorms mm-hmm. and you make it real big yep that would not have will not fly in current standard yeah we're going to return to this towards the end of the show so keep this in mind okay so we're going to so now start... we have some real cards so these are the cards that we found interesting some for constructed for like standard some for maybe commander yep some stuff that you guys wanted to hear about yeah so first up it's a blue card so i'll read it so you don't have to talk about islands too much um, <laughs> i actually really like this card okay so. Sublime I'm, I'm going to hate it cast against me, but... Sublime Epiphany, four blue-blue. 
Mm -hmm. for, and this is a rare, it's an instant, and it says choose one or more. Right. Counter target spell. Okay. Counter target activated or triggered ability. Okay. Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Uh Uh-huh. Create a token that's a copy of a creature you control. Uh Uh-huh. Target player draws the card. Yeah. There's a lot of text on this card, and you can choose as many of those as you want. So you could technically choose all of them. Right. I think that kind of the default mode for this, if it resolves in standard, is going to be like counter bounce draw card. Yeah, either counter bounce draw card or counter bounce make a copy draw card. Yeah, but it's going to be some combination of those uh, options for the most part. Mm -hmm. Like the odds of you being able to counter a spell and stifle something. Right. Yeah, uh, it's slim to none. Yeah, I mean, it it takes care of all parts of a hydroid crisis. All parts. That is Uh, true. I have heard people bring up the fact that like this card's kind of unplayable if mystic- mystical disputes in the format. Mm, yeah. Right. Like you tap your six mana and they yeah. tap one mana and blow you all the way out. Right. But if this resolves, like that will just end a game. Yeah. But I worry that was it like mystical disputes, like the most, one of the most main decked cards yeah. in standard. Yeah. Right? Like, it's just super risky to play something like this. That's true. Yeah. Now, like, in, let's say, Commander, this will probably resolve. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? And when it does, it'll be super powerful. If you're, like, counting one person's spell, bouncing someone else's permanent, copying one of your creatures, all these things seem good. What do you think about this in Pioneer? It's like Pioneer's uh, Cryptic Command, right? Yeah, but it costs six. Like, if it cost five, maybe. But, like, six... You don't think this is playing, like, blue-white control in Pioneer? I bet you it does. Maybe, like, one? Yeah, like, I, like a can't... two of, I think. Yeah, you can't have a ton of these in your deck. A ton of, like, six-mana counters. Right. But, I mean, it will catch you up. Yeah. And so... you also get Gear Hulk in uh, Pioneer. Yeah, I mean, if you get to, like, cast one of these off a of Gear Hulk, mm-hmm. like, that's, like, you've lived the dream. Oh, you could, you could cast this, copy your gear hulk, and flash it back. You could. Yeah. Or you flash in your gear gear hulk, you cast this. You oh, you co- can make a copy and bounce it. Yeah. You, gear hulk exiles this though, so you don't get to do that like once. But that's that's all you need. It'd just be a glorious <laughs> like. I'm gonna have a gear hulk. I'm gonna put this other gear hulk in my hand. And the Gear Hulk I copied is going to cast my hieroglyphic, hieroglyphic illuminations that I cycled on turn one. Yes. It's like a 75 for one. I think, <laughs> I think we're done here. Yeah. So I think standard, it has some issues because of mystical dispute, mm-hmm. but it is like undeniably powerful. Okay. And like, you know, if your blue opponent at your like, you know, pre release or when you're playing pre release on Arena, passes with six mana mm-hmm. just have it the back of, back of your mind that you could get blown all the way out yeah i mean you can't really play it around it either though no it's a rare it is super hard to play around but like you just like slam your card into it and then you're just like oh well that's what i mean like what are you gonna do nothing yeah no it's you, true you can't just do nothing like if they have it they're gonna blow you out there's not really much you can do yeah i think the card's I, really good i want to talk about it because i think it's cool and I don't think too many blue cards are cool, so. I also have no idea what's going on in this art. Yeah, it's really strange. It She's like, having a sublime epiphany. Apparently, like, there's just, like, a layered, like, pool in her yeah. brain. And there's, like, Something. a dude on her finger. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's weird. All right, next up, Teferi, Master of Time. Yeah. The only card in the set <laughs> with phasing. This is true. Oh, yeah, the I forgot. The card. Yeah. They brought phasing back for this one card. For this one card. So I guess that's how you get around the storm scale. You just slap it on a mythic. Right. And you're like, eh, no one's going to have to deal with this in limited. Yeah. And people that are playing constructive, they just have to figure it out. Yeah. YOLO, whatever. So, Fairy Master of Time, two, blue, blue, for a three loyalty planeswalker. Mm-hmm. It has the static ability, 
You may activate loyal abilities, loyalty abilities of Teferi, Master of Time, on any player's turn. Mm-hmm. Anytime you could play an instant. So, yep, basically Flash. Yeah, so basically in a 1v1 game, every turn cycle you get to activate Teferi twice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Plus one, draw a card, then discard. Mm-hmm. Minus three, target creature you don't control phases out. Right. And then minus 10, take two extra turns after this one. Yeah, that's pretty good. Like I included this. I know we talked about this twice now on the show. So I included this not necessarily to talk about this card in particular, because like I said, we've talked about it twice now, but just this being present in the format, like what does this do to the format? <sighs> I don't like, Is this know. another three mana Teferi where it just warps the whole format around it and creatures are bad and no. removal's bad and... No, right? I mean, the fact that Teferi made it so you couldn't do something or just right. like erased an entire uh, type of card mm-hmm. from the format, right. like this doesn't do that. And like the the fact that it phases mm-hmm. out your creature. Now, one, if you have a Teferi, you have to do the minus on your opponent's turn. Yeah, otherwise they still get the creature. Yeah, otherwise it just comes back. And when something phases out and phases back in, it doesn't become summoning sick. Right. It just it wasn't there, but then it is there, but it was there. I guess it comes back on the untap, so it's there through an upkeep. Mm-hmm. So that's how it gets around being summoning sick. Yep. So you have to do the minus on your opponent's turn. Right. And the fact that you don't have to repay the mana... Yeah. Isn't like as punishing as three mana Teferi where it was like bounce and they like ate your third turn and drew a card. Right. Yeah. Th- I mean, that's another thing is this is kind of a tempo swing like the other Teferi was, but at least they're not up a card when you answer this. They're not up a card. You can answer it at instant speed. Yeah. So your opponent plays their Teferi and then you can just play Eat to Extinction. Right. And you get to play your next turn. Mm-hmm. As opposed to they play their Teferi, you stare at your instant, yeah. and then you have to waste your next turn. Right. So I think this is probably worse than three mana Teferi. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably playable, but it's definitely not a thing that's going to define the format, I don't think. Yeah, those were pretty much my thoughts exactly. I had heard, not a lot, but I had heard some chatter around the interwebs about, oh, no, another Teferi. Like, this is so bad for the format, whatever. And that was not my opinion. Um, I think some of that was just from having two, like, format warping Teferis in a row in standard. And I don't think people need to be as scared of this Teferi as the previous ones. I think when we talked about it before... I said that the other two Teferis were doing a lot of heavy lifting on its pre-sale price. Yeah. Like it was pre-selling for like $40. I don't know what it's at now, Yeah, I but it did, it did not strike me as a $40 Planeswalker. No. That's going to like warp the entire format around it. Yep. I think this one's probably safe. And the mm-hmm. fact that the plus is just card selection and not card advantage yeah. is also an important distinction. Like, the decks that are going to play this, though, card selection is almost card advantage, though. This is true, but, like, if you have your fifth land in your hand and you plus this, you don't want to discard that land for a spell. True. Right? So then you're kind of throwing away a spell that is okay, but it's still a spell you you would probably use. Well, I mean, maybe, though. Like, Marshall and LSV had this argument on limited resource at one point, like how much is a loot worth? Um, And it depends on, you know, what's off the top of your deck. Like if the top of your deck is a land and you already have your next land, like this is worth slightly, slightly more than it would be normally because you get to get through that land. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's worth the next card is another Teferi. Then obviously you don't need two Teferis, but it's worse than if it were just like plus one draw card. Right. Yeah. Right. And like this could have easily just been plus one draw card. Mm -hmm. And that would have probably been too good if it was drawing you two cards a turn. Oh, yeah. That would have been way too good. If it was effectively plus two draw two. Yeah. Would have been too much. Yeah. That's terrifying. Right. Okay. 
Next up, we have Teferi's Tutelage. Yeah. Ooh, a sweet curveball. <laughs> yeah. I knew you weren't expecting this one. Yeah. So it's two and a blue for mm-hmm. an uh, enchantment uh-huh. that says when it enters the battlefield, draw a card and discard a card. Okay. And whenever you draw a card, target opponent mills two cards. Yeah, they keyworded mill. That's fun. They did. I have been playing a lot of Psychic Corrosion Mm -hmm. in uh, the Arena Cube. I don't know if Psychic Corrosion got played, excuse me, in Standard. A little bit. I ran across it every once in a while. And there was uh, Sphinx's Tutelage, Mm -hmm. which uh, would mill them for two when you drew a card. And if the two cards shared a color, you repeated the process. You would repeat it. Mm hmm. Um, and that card got played in some like tier F modern decks. Yep. So this is a card that's interesting, but probably more interesting, not so much for what it does to the format, but for the fact that it says mill. We have a lot of different kinds of listeners. And I think that there are strategies that could use this pretty well. One of them being cycling. Yeah. It's like an alternate win con. Well, not just an alternate win con. Oh, yeah, I guess it is target opponent. So, yeah, yeah, it would be like an alternate win con then, yes. Yeah, where you just I, like... I was thinking you can mill yourself, but... And just make your make your things real big. Yeah. Giant Zenith players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's target opponent. Yeah. I don't know if there is, uh, like, the rest of the tools in standard for a mill deck, but... Well, you got Secret Keeper and, like you said, Psychic Corrosion. Is Psychic Corrosion currently in standard? Yeah, isn't that the one from... Um guilds or whatever no that's drowned secrets oh that's the one i was thinking of which one's like a corrosion it's two and a blue whenever you draw a card target opponent mills two oh okay so it's this without the loot yeah so like this is a strictly better psychic corrosion yep because of the loot because it mills them when it comes into play right as opposed to psychic corrosion which just is like yo i'm saying it just comes into play yeah it just comes into play yeah yeah, no, I was thinking of uh, Drowned Secrets. Yeah, Drowned yeah, Secrets. You have Drowned Secrets, you have this, you have... Uh, Secret Keeper. Secret Keeper, Ventress Gargoyle. Please. Didn't say yeah. please. The the one-drop blue creature that mills them for two and you mm-hmm. scry two. So yep. one, two. And you get the yeah. Gargoyle. Yeah, I mean, there's there's something there, but those decks typically aren't great. But if that's your jam... Right. This, and especially now you. when there's graveyard decks in the format, Uro's everywhere, then that's... Yeah. That's kind of a feel bad. I feel like Uro is going to be everywhere. Yeah. We're trying to get to a certain A drop, I think. Yep. <laughs> this card's dumb and shows you they did not play Tess Loris. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think this card's good, though, like even with Loris not in the format. I agree. They just did not play Tess Loris yeah. at all. Yeah. So what does this do? What am I angry about? <laughs> this is a uh, archfiend's vessel it's a single black mana for a one one human cleric with lifelink and when archfiend's vessel enters the battlefield if it entered from your graveyard or you cast it from your graveyard exile it if you do create a five five black demon token with flying so if it's in your graveyard somehow yep. and then you bring it back you just get a five five mm-hmm. again they printed loris right maybe arguably in the top 20 of all time magic cards. Uh, Yeah, definitely. No argument here. Maybe top 10 of all time magic cards. Like we're like, yeah, still no argument here. Yeah. We're like the power is absurd. The power nine Loris and Oko are like jockeying for position. Oh yeah. They're fighting with a time ball. Yeah. So, so we print that. And then we're like, man, you know what it needs? Some help. Five fives. <laughs> it needs one made of five fives. Yeah. No, well, they need to be able to chump block and then on turn four, <laughs> play a three two life flicker and pay a, play a one man of five five. Yep. We don't want it to be like behind. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this card seems, seems strong. Yeah, there's a uh, lot of good stuff to play with it in standard right now. You have Call of the Death Dweller. Yeah, which I think is great yeah. for yeah. this. Um, you also have Nethroy, which reanimates when it mutates, reanimates okay. a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we still have Blood for Bones. Yeah. So you can sack this for Blood for Bones and then bring it back and you get a 5-5 five, five, and you return to another creature from your hand. 
Yeah. And we still have Cavalier and Knight also. Yeah, that when it dies, it brings something back. Yep. Yeah, I think that those are all reasonable things to do with this. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there is a pioneer. Mm -hmm. There was the the black, white, like zombie rally the ancestors. Um, oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, was it Return to the Ranks or yep. the the one that has Convoke? Yeah, right? it was Return to the Ranks. Yeah. So this is something that you self mill it or something and instead of like getting a bunch of like enters the battlefield like zombie related triggers right you just make a five five mm -hmm. just instant speed three mana five five with a bunch of friends yep five so, five will end a game quick yeah and if you you know god forbid get, get like two of them like oh yeah yeah ggs so th yeah this is a card that will do some powerful things if you're able to build around it mm -hmm. it's just are the things that you have to do to build around it? Like, does it allow you to be competitive? Well, I think a lot of what you're trying to do with this guy, we were already trying to do in standard anyway, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, we weren't bringing stuff back. Right. But yeah, fill, you're just trying to fill your graveyard and then get him back out somehow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, however you do that, there's not good ways in standard right now to like get things back on mass. That's true. Other than like, again, like call the, De the death dweller, you mm -hmm. know, if you play one of these and chump and then you Meyer Triton and mill in mill one. Right. And you just get 10 mana, you get 10 power for three mana. Mm -hmm. Great. Like you just win that game. Yeah. Like there's not a whole lot anyone does, Yep. but you know, it's going to just be difficult to see that like being consistent. Is there still like a red black call the death dweller Kroxa deck? Not that I've seen as of late. Yeah. Um, that was a deck for a little bit though. Oh no, it was. And I think like, yeah. So this like, guy fits into that strategy pretty well. Yeah. You like, again, like you can chump block with this somehow like this. Yeah, into Kroxa. It. yeah. But this into Kroxa into flashback at Kroxa, get a five, mm -hmm. five. Yeah. That deck for a little while was playing um, cathartic reunion too. Okay. So another way to get this in the yard. Yeah. Uh, but you, do, you just don't want to like bring it back with like the reanimation spells that cost like four or five mana. Yeah. Then it's not really worth it. Yeah. Then you're not like, cause you know, you're, there's five mana, five fives. There's a five mana, six, six trample vigilance. Yeah. Right. Whatever that we're yeah. like, that's probably not playable. Right. So getting these back, getting five fives for two or three banner is where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Also, remember claim fame? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. This this yeah. gets this gets uh, claimed. Ooh. And then you can give the the demon haste. Haste. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. So send me up for that. Yeah, I mean, there's something here. Yeah. So it's just finding the right home, but I think this card is something that people are gonna like run into. Mm -hmm. It's cool. I like it. Hey. Hey, your boy's back. This might be my great one of my greatest calls in magic. <laughs> this is a Kite Self Rebooter. Yeah. Uh, reprint from Ixalan. One in a black for a 1-2 flyer. When it enters a battlefield, you look at your opponent's hand and choose a non-creature, non-land card it, from it. Exile it until Kite Self Rebooter leaves the battlefield. So 1-2 flyer. Mm -hmm. So when this got printed in Ixalan, I was like, huh is does this make modern humans a deck because now it has like some interaction mm -hmm. and this plus unclaimed territory made yeah. modern humans a deck it did the so, answer was yes i think this is a good card to have in standard yeah this could with like gray merchant and some of the other cards that are currently in standard mm -hmm. make like a mono black devotion style deck like viable yeah, um, this card also plays pretty well in like tempo strategies. Yeah, where you're able to like just get a removal spell and then get some damage in. Yeah, like if you play this on turn two and you know grab the only three drop in their hand, like I mean that's pretty good. Yeah, it buys you a turn. Next up, this is your card here. <laughs> this is a uh, Liliana Waker of the Dead. It's a uh, two black black four loyalty. Plus one, each player discards a card. Each opponent who can't loses three life. Minus three, target creature gets neg X, neg X till end of turn, where X is the number of 
cards in your graveyard. Neg seven, you get an emblem with at the beginning of combat on your turn, put target creature card from a graveyard, not just yours, onto the battlefield under your control and give it haste. This card is fantastic. This is so close to Liliana the Veil. Yeah, like her plus actually can like win you the game. Mm -hmm. Unlike the other Lily. Yeah. Uh, But her minus is significantly worse. Um, Significantly worse? Yeah. If you have a situation where, you know, thinking about like modern and they Mm -hmm. like play a Tarmogoyf. Well, I mean, this card's not modern playable. You're not going to play this over Lily of the Veil. No. But this is extremely close for Pioneer and Standard, though. Maybe. I just, like the times where her minus doesn't do anything and she just kind of gets smushed. Right, now she'll have five loyalty, but just like Liliana the Veil, there were a lot of times where you would like play Lily Mm -hmm. down tick and get rid of the only threat on the board. Yeah. And this doesn't guarantee you to get rid of that only threat. This is true. Right, so like Liliana the Veil would like kind of clean the battlefield for herself so Mm -hmm. then her plus could take over. Yeah. And this might not always do that. I think the times where you are able to do that, Mm -hmm. it's going to be really powerful. Yeah. But I think there's going to be a lot of times where, like, the minus three is, like, gives, like, neg two, neg two. Maybe you're right. Then then it's just not going to give you that. So it might be in more of a deck where you have to play, like, fewer threats and, like, more More answers. answers. Yeah. um, So that you can, you know, make sure the battlefield's clear. And then you just, like, you know, you're just plussing. And you're like, all right. Like, you have to, like, play every card you draw. Mm-hmm. And then I'm just going to draw removal spells and kill you with my, the Lily Plus. Yeah, bolt you every turn. Yeah. So I think it could be interesting. Mm-hmm. It could be, like, a Pioneer. If there could be, like, a Pioneer, like, Attrition deck. Yeah. I think, as we've talked about before, it's super hard to play, like, Attrition strategies in Standard. Yeah. Because you're like, I get rid of all your cards. And then you're like, okay, I'll crisis make an 8-8 eight, eight and draw four cards. And you're like, oh. <laughs> but I got rid of all your cards. I guess this doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. No, I think it's interesting, but I just don't know if it's going to be like ubiquitous. Yeah. All right. I dig it. I think the card's sweet. Thieves Guild Enforcer. Yeah, I'm kind of on the fence about this one. Yeah, this is weird. So it's a black mana for a 1-1. Mm-hmm. Yep. And remember when Flash was a blue and green thing? <laughs> well, this has Flash as well. They right. started giving black Flash in like Ixalan? I think so, yeah. And it was like Flash in and get a bonus when something died. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay, this makes sense. This has no reason to have Flash. So Correct. when it comes into play, or another rogue enters the battlefield under your control. Each opponent mills two cards. Mm-hmm. Okay. As long as an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, Thieves Guild Enforcer gets plus two, plus one, and has Death Touch. It's really close to being good, though. Like, yeah. if, if this milled you when it entered the battlefield, it'd be great. It would be. I think you have to worry about, like, you flash this in and mill your opponent, and they're just two cards closer to Uro. Right. And then you're like, oh. And then they escape an Uro and it loses plus two, plus one in Death Touch. <laughs> yeah, and you're just like, oh, I have a 1-1 one, one yeah. that like was, I don't know, a, a desperate ritual for your, uh, for your yeah. Uro. Yeah. <laughs> oh. If it is possible for there to be a blue-black flash deck, mm-hmm. this card just goes in that deck. Probably. Right? It fits in a blue-black tempo strategy. Mm-hmm. where you're trying to make a biggish kind of thing, take a card with a free booter, yeah. play, what is it, Slither Wisp? Uh, yeah, for my Coria, yeah. Yeah, and then just kind of get in the beats. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that deck loses its absolute best card in Brianborn Cutthroat. Yeah. And I don't know how you replace that card. Like, Kite Sail Free Booter's, booter's cool and all, but it's not like a two-mana 5-4. Yeah. So I think this is good, but I don't know if this is the kind of magic we get to play anymore. Probably not. I would like it to be. Like, those decks are fun. Mm -hmm. See, this card has so many weird parallels, though. 
Like, okay. It, it's kind of what was that white card from uh, Kaladesh? Oh, um, Toolcraft Exemplar. Yeah, like it's, it's Toolcraft Exemplar E, like adjacent because so tool- of the like one mana three two. Yeah, so Toolcraft Exemplar was a one mana one one, and if you controlled an artifact, it, was beca- it just one artifact. I thought it was like two or three. Maybe artifacts. it's two. Some number of artifacts. It got plus uh, plus two plus one. Plus two plus one. Uh, on, at the beginning of your combat step. Mm-hmm. So this is like a big one mana threat. Yeah. Which is good. The fact that it has th- flash makes it a little flexible. Mm-hmm. Usually- it's, so, it's so close to being good on like a bunch of different axes, but I think it just misses on all of them. Yeah. Like, I think the problem is since we have escape and like <laughs> Uro is the most played card imaginable. Yeah. I guess it's not gross spiral, but it's close. Um, <laughs> like milling is usually neutral. Right. Or slightly like favorable for you. Right. Because you've set up your deck to mill or like the mill is just like, ah, whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Right. But I feel like the mill in current standard is like actively bad. Yeah. You're just helping your, you're probably helping your opponent's game plan. Yes. When eight of the top eight decks in a major tournament are running Uro, then yeah. you probably don't want to help them. Like get their Uros back or find them. Yeah. Right. And I mean, then you have like Kroxa. It's like, oh, well, they'll play red, black. And it's like, okay, well then you might help them get their Kroxa. Right. But what about white cards? Well, if Elspeth's good enough. Yeah. All right. So yeah, it just seems like the mill might be downside mm-hmm. and like the plus two plus one is a little inconsistent yeah so i would like it to be good i'd like this to be the kind of magic you could play Mm -hmm. i mean i'm sure there are the like the draws where you just go like this into another one into another one into another one and you're attacking for nine on turn three oh yeah oh yeah like the the uh, oh yeah because this would trigger for so it would trigger for itself and then on turn two, it trigger tr- tr- for two more. Two more. Like, so you, where you have like and then the each fervent, of them would trigger. Yeah, you'd have like the fervent yeah. champion draw. Yeah. Where like your mono red opponent plays three fervent champions and you just die. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of the same thing. You're like, take one, take three, right. take nine. We want it to be good, folks. I do want it to be good. We just don't know if it is. Yeah, I'm, I don't think it is. All right. Chandra's Pyrelang. Yeah, this is a two mana, one three elemental lizard. And whenever a source you control deals non combat damage to an opponent, Chandra's Pyreling gets plus one plus oh and gains double strike till end of turn. So this is, what is the, the one f- three flyer? Uh, Chandra's something or other. Yeah, that has the same initial text when it, when yeah. you, you, you deal an opponent non combat damage, it gets plus three plus oh. Or yep. plus two plus oh? Yeah, something um, like that. Yeah. This is kind of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Giving double strike can be real good. Yeah. The fact that it's on the ground is a problem. Yeah, and it doesn't have trample. Yeah, it has no kind of evasion. You're just trying to like run it into things. Mm-hmm. But this can lead to super explosive draws too. Yeah, like I think we just kind of like teased out like Scorch Spitter into mm-hmm. this into cavalcade with a uh, a fervent champion mm-hmm. is just like all the damage if they don't have a blocker yeah like it i think it's one two three four five triggers or five non-combat damages or four yeah, it, it's lethal yeah it's a lot yeah so like this gives you those kind of draws but other times it's a dopey one three for two that's not playable right so I think there's probably a spot for it in like mono red cavalcade. Yeah. Like that's kind of the thing with the mono red decks too. We've talked about it in the show before how mono red gets so much better, like with every set leading up to rotation. So the bigger the standard is, the more sets that are in it, the better mono red gets. And we are currently at the biggest standard. Yeah. And that's usually when mono red is best because yep. it gets all those, red commons and uncommons that make the aggressive draft decks work Mm -hmm. are now all there for you to pick the best, you know, 
22 one and two drops. Yep. And this certainly gives the, like you said, the cavalcade decks a shot right in the arm. Yeah. All right. Next up. Oh, conspicuous Snoop. Yeah. Snoop, Snoop. I, uh, I missed the boat on being able to play this because I'm not going to spend like $20 for an uncommon. <laughs> the uncommons, they've come back down. I think they're six bucks. Okay. I, the uh, I, I Antis think... Hovels, though, are like 26 right now, I think. Ah. Uh, they were you. like $5 last week. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Conspicuous Snoop is red, red for a 2 2. Mm-hmm. It's a goblin rogue. You play with the top card of your library revealed. Mm -hmm. And you may cast any goblin spells from the top of your library. Yeah, so as long as the top card of your library is a goblin, you can play it just like it was in your hand. And as long as the top card of your library is a goblin, Conspicuous Snoop has all activated abilities of that card. Yeah. So I think we talked about this before. Uh, This and whatever the Boggart Harbinger... That is the card. Is a two card like turn three win mm-hmm. in modern. Yep. So you get uh, the Harbinger gets a Kiki Jiki. Snoop gets the copy ability of the Kiki Jiki. Mm-hmm. You make an arbitrarily large number of Snoops. And then the last Snoop, you have copy of the Harbinger and you put like a Mog Fanatic on top of your deck. Yeah. And, and then, then it gets all- the ability of the Mog Fanatic. Yeah. Then all of your copies just sack themselves for one. Right. That's why the hovels are 20 something dollars. <laughs> and the uncommons from Lorwyn are six dollars. Yeah. And so, Kiki Jiki Kiki Jiki spiked too, I think. Oh, it did? Okay. Yeah. But this is just a solid card in goblins generically. Yeah. And a good card in this like newfound like combo goblins. Mm-hmm. As Pleasant Kenobi say, com goblins. <laughs> Cob goblins. Yeah, com goblins. Yes, uh, <laughs> combo goblins. Got it. Com, com goblins. Um, <laughs> so, like, you could very easily just play like a like the traditional like mono red goblins deck where you just have some black sources so you can, oops, I win. Mm-hmm. Or you could play more of like a, a red black goblins deck where you have um, the combo cards that you need to win but you're mm-hmm. playing the goblin munition expert, like the, right. the cards for modern horizons. Yeah. So between the cards from got from modern horizons and the ones that we had, like in, was it Dominaria? Yeah. Um, a lot of good goblins got kind of injected into modern and like really needed something to tie the deck together. And this absolutely does that. Yeah. So this is just the piece that you get to like just combo people with. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you can play like the traditional kind of like grindy card advantage goblins plan. Yep. And then also have the oops, I win button mm-hmm. in your deck. You sometimes you just look at your opening hand and go like, oh, I'm going to win now. Mm-hmm. So this is one that like if it gets remotely close to cheapish, I think you oh, should yeah. just get just because. As many as you can. Yeah. Because they're going to, it's going to be a card that's just going to be in goblins forever. Yep. If this ever gets down to under a dollar, I will probably own at least a hundred of them. There you go. So once that happens, watch the spike on TCG as <laughs> after he buys out TCG. It'll be my fault. Yes. Um, Gadrak, the Crown Scourge. Yeah, this is a fun one. I I really hadn't heard anybody talking about this, so I kind of wanted to go over it with you. Um, I especially hadn't heard anybody talking about this, like either in our you know local chat here or in the store chats. Yeah. So this is two and a red for a legendary dragon. It's a five four flyer. He can't attack unless you control four or more artifacts. And then at the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token for each non token creature that died this turn. Yeah. So what do you um, think about this guy? I worry that he won't be on enough. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least you get a three mana five four blocker, mm-hmm. so that's good. But I don't know like what deck you build around him to make sure he's on fast enough. To, so what like, format matter. are we talking about? Standard? Sure, we'll start with standard. Like I don't okay. know. Like I mean, Ginger Brute 
dot deck. Yeah, I mean, Ginger Brute's one way to do it. I don't know what else you're playing around Ginger Brute, though. Do we have any, like, zero-cost artifacts, right? We have Tormod's Crypt, but that's not, not like, super playable. Yeah. I mean, it is, but not I really mean, where you, you want to be have, in your aggressive uh, deck. Yeah, the problem is, like, the artifacts that you might want to play, Golden Egg and uh, Guild Globe, yeah. aren't aggressive cards, and this strikes me as a card that wants to be aggressive. Mm-hmm. Right, like you don't want to like be, kind of like doing eh, yeah, with your five four. I mean, we do have um, steel overseer, so I don't know if there are enough enough constructs or artifact creatures in general. Yeah, like yeah, yeah steel know. overseer was last set, right? It was M twenty. Yeah, it was M twenty. So like you have that, and then you have like some like of the you said, bad ginger brute. ginger brute, and then like the the one one that dies and puts a one one counter on something. Yeah, sparring construct. Yeah, but like that seems like you're playing a really bad card to what's make. What's the uh, what's Pinocchio? Pinocchio is a one mana o oh, two that scries when it comes into play, and it dies into a creature. It dies into a. It, you can sacrifice it. You can exile it. Oh, okay. And it becomes yeah. a one-one human. Mm-hmm. It should become a one-one boy token, but it does not. It should. <laughs> uh, it's just like a, a one-one human. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like those are two like bad cards right. to try to make your your three mana five four like good. So and what that, about like a different format? It's just I don't think you want to be doing this in modern. No, probably not. What about pioneer though? I mean, you get a uh, dark steel citadel. Mm-hmm. You get. Uh, you get Ornithopter. Yeah. You also get Bomat Courier and Scrap Heap Scrounger, which are both aggro artifact creatures. There you go. Okay. Like, I guess that if you did something like that, you know, one, two, three into this, mm-hmm. on turn four, it would attack mm-hmm. because it would make a uh, a treasure Yeah, to be the third artifact. Then you just have to have your fourth artifact to play. Right. So there could maybe be something there. But I don't know, like usually these creatures that have some sort of downside that like make you work yeah. don't end up making it. Right. Right. Think about Wayward Sword Swordtooth. Like he's yeah. played to play a an extra land. An extra land. He's not played yeah. to be a five five. If he's a five five, great. Yeah. Right. But it's put into a, a land that wants a deck that wants to play a bunch of lands. Mm-hmm. Right. This you kinda have to have it kind of have to have a, uh, the city's blessing. What about in a deck like uh, we used to play that side deck, the Joyra Psy? Oh, Master Thopterus? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would draw you a card off of a Joyra. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're playing a bunch of cheap artifacts. Yeah. That I don't know. Get I don't know doubled if, with Psy. Yeah, I don't know if that like if that pulls you into too many different directions where like yeah, maybe you have like ten one one flyers. Do you really need a five four? Right. What about um like the new Sahili? Maybe where like you're you have like Sahili and like this as your like your threats your threats, and you just are like all right Sahili make a bunch of things turn this guy on yeah shock shock opt whatever yeah maybe I don't know it's just all these creatures that like make you work hardly mm-hmm. ever work out right so three mana five four flyers cheap though it is I mean and it gets the block. Mm-hmm. At least it's not like it can't attack or block because Wayward Swordtooth can't do either, right? Uh, right. Yeah, it can't do anything. You imagine this if Oko was still in the format, just making <laughs> food every turn? It would just be a 3-3. Three, three. <laughs> well, that's true, yeah. <laughs> it would just be a 3-3. Three, three. Team or 3-3s. Three, Next up, this is a card that people are, are excited for. Mm-hmm. I'm confused as to why. Oh, really? I think this card's great. It's uh, I- Terror of the Peaks, 3 red red for a 5-4 flyer. Spells your opponent's cast that target Terror of the Peaks cost an additional three life to cast. Whenever another creature enters a battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. We had a very similar card to this that was playable, mm-hmm. but it was th- it was one mana less. Yeah, two red red. Yeah, so it was, it was four a- four. Yeah, uh, but it didn't have the third ability. It didn't have the third ability. But just like we talked about Elder Gargoth, mm-hmm. where we were like, it comes into play and doesn't do anything. Right. This kind of comes into play and doesn't do anything. And uh, yeah. like, 
like you worry about just like pay your five mana and then get nothing out of it yeah. and the three life when you target it with a removal spell can matter right if if yeah. this is like the the top end of like a big red deck where well, if they so pl- play this that's kind of like what i was thinking though is where gargara or gargoth or whatever wants you to play like an attrition game like a long incremental advantage game this is curve topper for an aggressive deck i yeah. think this even though they're similarly costed and like you could i mean they're even comparable um i think this serves that role much better yeah i mean Skarg and Hellkite saw very little play. Oh, this is way better than Skarg and Hellkite, though. Skarg and Hellkite has haste. Don't the Gruul decks play Domri anyway? Domri doesn't give haste. I thought it gave Riot. That's big Domri. Oh. Uh, Little Domri, the plus, gives you mana and your creature spells can't be countered. Oh, I got Big you. Domri was give, give you mana and your spell gets Riot. Yeah. No, like, I think this would be in a deck where... You know, you're play. You're trying to play like two, three, four, five, mm-hmm. where you might be playing uh, like Legion War Boss into Questy, or if you were just more like Mono Red, Big Red, uh, Tectonic. Oh, okay. Whatever, Tectonic yeah. Giant. Yeah. Oh, I uh, forgot that card even existed. Right, and, and then into this where like you're gonna punish them for. Yeah. Right, where you're trying to, you know, you're trying to get in damage so that the pay three life to to target this is actually a real cost. A real cost. And it's like, well, yeah. but they have to do it because if you untap with it and you play anything, right, they just die. Mm-hmm. Right. So I mean it could just be where where it's gotta be like, you know, robber of the rich, Legion War Boss, yeah, tectonic giant or whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And then terror of the peak, and that's your curve. Yeah, and like that's enough pressure that they can't kill this thing easily. Yeah. Or you know, in gruel, where you can go like you know a paradise druid spellbreaker, or paradise druid questing beast. Then this, mm-hmm. like that's enough pressure that they might that again the the three life cost is is a problem. Yeah, but if there's a bunch of like bant and like blue light running around and it's like just eight sweeper territory yeah it just doesn't do anything it just doesn't do anything so like i think there can be a deck for it but like then that deck is only good if there aren't a lot of like uh shadow of the skies yeah that's true and again it also has the the little teferi problem yeah and not just little teferi because like some of the other removal that that those decks play gets around this three life requirement also like banishing light elspeth conquers death elspeth conquers death yeah yeah just exile it and yeah it's It's not not a a spell so you don't have to pay three life yeah so the the big dragons are usually they're not always playable and this one might be different but like thunderbreak regent was i feel like it was like well thunderbreak regent saw play because like dragons was kind of an archetype yeah but it didn't see a ton of play, right? right? Like having the f- the first ability yeah. and being a mana cheaper, mm-hmm. that card saw some play. And it's right. like how much how much do you get out of the second ability? Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, this card certainly isn't glory bringer. Yeah, it's not like hasty two for one, right? Where like that card was just nuts. That card was great. I love that card. Remember when you could like drive around and. Go to like four different tournaments on a weekend to get all of your uh, promo glory bringers. Yeah, that was an awesome weekend. Those are those are those are different times. Yeah. Now I can't go to Target without being afraid. <laughs> all right. So next up, we have oh a two for here. Ooh, wombo combo. Yeah, c- 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 combo nation. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure everybody saw this, but I was scrolling through the card file and I came across Unleash Fury and said. Oh, hey, this works pretty good with that other card I just saw. Yeah. So Unleash Fury is a one and a red for an instant. Double the power of target creature until end of turn. Not double strike, just double the power. Which is interesting. Yeah, it's strange. One of the other uncommons in this set is Heartfire Immolator. Mm-hmm. One and a red for a 2-2 two, two with Prowess. And you can pay a red and sack it to have it deal damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker. 
So you can bash something for six and then throw it at someone. Right. Or something. Creature, yeah. planeswalker. Right. Hmm. That was kind of neat. We also have that uh, stuffy doll goblin. Oh, yeah. So you could throw this at that and then dome your opponent. Or uh, true fire mentor. Is that the... Oh, yeah. Yep, that also. Yeah. Seems like a lot of work. It is, but I thought it was fun and something we could talk about briefly. And, uh, I mean, we also have fling. We do. Yep. You can double something and then fling. Mm-hmm. I feel like Unleash Fury might have a home in an older format somewhere to like combo kill someone. Like it's effectively red oh, berserk. It is. Well, Ber- berserk is green and gives trample, but the creature right. dies. Right. And, but your goal is to just make them dead. Yeah. And this is somewhere like kind of like Team or Battle Rage. Yeah. I was just trying to think of differences between like this and Team or Battle Rage. Team or Battle Rage gives trample. Right. So like and double strike. But yeah, but like if there was like a red infect that wouldn't it would play that over this. Probably. I know the red infect is the mythical infect that we've been trying to put together for years. <laughs> they they keep trying, they're like, is this good enough for you? And we're like, no. <laughs> no. Take a man off of it and give it trample. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Hmm. And uh when you get one of these cards in your pack. Look closely at the gentleman who's throwing the punch. You Very may no- closely. You may notice something uh, prominent about him. <laughs> yeah. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. What do you think about this guy with Drake's? You mean Unleash Fury? Yeah. Where, where you've got like, you know, a 5-5 five, five Drake and you're just like 12 you. Right. I mean, it could work. Right. That deck sometimes like lacked reach or mm-hmm. lacked the ability to like close the game quickly. Yeah. Usually it took two turns. This would make it take like one. one turn. Yeah. And they reprinted Crash Through, which gives something haste and draws a card also. Crash Through, haste, or trample? Oh, it might be trample. You're, I think you're right. You only have one Drake. Enigma Drake's gone? That yeah, wasn't they, Core 20? That wasn't Core 20, I don't think. Oh, all right. I don't think. It was probably 19. You're probably right. But yeah. No, would had... it have been Core 19? Because Core 19 would have been out with Amonkhet. I think they were. Drake was in Amonkhet. I think they were like in back-to-back sets. I'm not 100% oh. sure though. Okay. But yeah, I, something like that where you are like just making one big threat to be able mm-hmm. to, cut a turn, to cut a turn off your clock is good. Yeah. It's a card we've not seen a card I don't think worded like this in a long time. Yeah, it's strange. Kind of what made me do a double take about it. Yeah. I mean, among other things. Right. <laughs> among other things. All right. Hey, this is, uh, I think this is from the Discord. This is from the Discord. So, Vado, Thorn of the Dust Rose. Vito? Vito, sorry. Yeah. Uh, phonics. Uh, <laughs> two and a black for a 1-3. Mm-hmm. Whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. And then three black black creatures you control gain life, gain life link until end of turn. Yep. So, like, it's three black black end the game, effectively. Mm-hmm. Because uh, this effectively gives all of your creatures double right. power. Right, and you gain a, a whole bunch life, of life, yeah. too. Again, like we were talking about, like in a, a Heliod... Daxos. A Daxos made. deck. Like, this could be good. I mean, it would also be very good if you could cast it with Linden. Oh, yeah. Where, yeah. like, when you attack, you just gain a bunch of life and deal a bunch of damage. Mm-hmm. For anyone who's commandery out there, this and Exquisite Blood just ends the game. Right. If you Infinite. gain a life. Yep, it just makes a loop and you kill everybody. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. It does pass like my first test for the card, which was when we got we asked about it initially. I said before they spoiled the uh, the power and toughness. Mm-hmm. I was like, if it's a two two, it's not playable. Right. As like it needs to be like a two three. It kind of met me in the middle. It was like a one three. Yeah. So like it doesn't die to shock and bone crusher giant. So like it has that little bit of a cushion. Yep. This is definitely one of those cards where it's like, is the rest of the deck around it good enough? Because it's probably good enough on its own. Mm-hmm. It's just does it have the support? Yeah. And I think that's what's going to determine if it's playable or not. Like if these life gain strategies are, you know, something you can realistically do, then. Maybe. Right, because if you're playing like life gain, you're playing again healer's hawk, 
Oh, um, I just had an awful thought. What? What if you played this with Uro? And your Uro just turns into Siege Rhino. <laughs> I mean, you can just do gross with Uro at all times. Right. So, yeah, this does just make it Siege Uro. Ur- right. Uro Rhino. <laughs> I like Siege Uro. Siege Uro. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that, but I was thinking in the black white decks, Healer's Hawk, Pride yeah. Mate. Like this would have to take like the Linden slot because like I don't think you want to have a white yeah, white, probably, white card. Yeah, and then you have like healers, uh, and then you have a uh, Heliodas also in there. Yeah, uh, and then maybe you play four mana Sor- Soren. Oh yeah, that's pretty good too because that gives all your creatures life link anyway. Uh huh. So like that could be like you wouldn't have to activate this five mana ability. You would just like get to bash. Right. There could be something. I'm trying to think what the other one drops would be. Uh, Knight of the Ebon Legion. Oh yeah, yeah. So you have that. Cat yeah. oven. Cat. Ooh, cat oven would be good. Yeah. Yeah. So there could be something there. It There's, cuts I, the amount of clicks from cat down down in half. It does. It does. Yay! We only have another like year of <laughs> cat oven clicks. Yeah. I mean, this could be a thing. Mm-hmm. I. Again, I just worry that there's not a, not the support or there's just right. way better stuff to do. Like the yeah. the argument of, am I doing this and is it just a worse version of something else? Right. Right. Is like putting black in your deck, just making your mono white life game deck bad. Yeah. Next up is... It's another one from Discord. It's a okay. Invigorating Surge. Two and a green for an instant. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control, then double the number of plus one plus one counters on that creature. Seems like it falls short for constructed. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of just worse. Was it Hydra's whatever form of the Hydra? The the enchantment. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same mana cost. But it doesn't like threaten to run away with the game. Right. And like usually put two plus one plus one counters on something which is kind of this is this this at a baseline mm-hmm. is usually four mana or has mm-hmm. been four mana in the past so this is a little bit better yeah. but those spells usually aren't playable and constructed right i um, think that if you have a reasonable like plus one plus one counter deck in limited this could be great yeah there are like some playable hydras right now though like we have crisis and voracious hydra yeah is that still in the format it is, yeah, it's core 20. Okay. Yeah. Though that gets a little win more. You're like your 8 8 Hydra becomes a 19, an 18 18 Hydra. Well, right, but your 3 3 Hydra becomes a 8 8 Hydra also. Fair. And what about like Chamber Sentry? <sighs> they reprinted them. So sad. <laughs> I've got 70 for when, when zero cost creatures break. But or, um, Ugin's Conjurant is still in the format, right? I think so, yeah. That's the... The, the colorless... X, yeah, the x mana zero zero. Yeah, again, a lot of work that's really fragile. Yeah. But, I mean, it could be a thing. We have uh, Pelucranos, too. We do. 24-24 <laughs> Polykays, let's go. Well, yeah, I mean, you cast him on turn four or whatever, and then turn five, you this and fight something. Not enough mana. Well, maybe you got a, like you cast an Uro already and you got an extra okay. land. I don't know. I was going to say the fight's three mana. But yeah, I don't know. There are things that can use that could be doubled that are like good cards, but I don't know if it's like good card plus like ant card equals good interaction. Are Nissa lands plus one plus one counters? They are. So it works with that too. There you go. Making eight eights with your Nissa. Yeah. That'll end the game in a hurry. It will. All right. Next up. Uh, this is mine. This one's all you, buddy. So Silver Moat Ghoul is mm-hmm. a two and a black for a three one. Mm-hmm. Uh, just erase the casting cost. Uh, you, shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't do that. At the beginning of your end step, if you gained three or more life this turn, return Silver Moat Ghoul from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And then for some reason they gave it more text. <laughs> One of the black, sacrifice silver moat ghoul, draw a card. Right. And you don't have to tap it. You don't have to tap it. It's just one of the black, sack it. 
Yep, so you can use it right when it comes out. Okay, so this is like a card advantage engine with the second ability. Mm -hmm. And three life just happens to be what Uro gives you Mm -hmm. and what Creeping Chill give you. Right. So if you are aggressively self-milling yourself, this is just a free thing to come back if you bring back an Uro. Correct. And I know that like, you know, getting back an Uro is usually enough or playing the first Uro, right? But like this could lead to draws where you, you know, especially like in like, let's say historic, barring what jumpstart does to historic, yeah. right? Stitch your supplier into a thing that mills some more cards. Mm-hmm. If you hit one or two of these and then you play your Uro and you just get like two, three ones on the battlefield, for free like that's good enough Mm -hmm, probably so there is a limited number of ways to get them back basically it's just creeping chill and um uro Mm -hmm. but that can be enough the three drop out of was it guilds the demir three drop it was one black black for a three one and when you surveilled you could do something but didn't it have lifelink Oh, I think it did. Where, like, if you surveilled, like, you could bring it back from your graveyard to your hand. And when it came into play, it exiled a card. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. If it if that has lifelink, that could work. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that has lifelink randomly. Tribal three ones. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh, no. Whatever the, the one one first strike guy, the hard counter to tribal three ones. <laughs> yeah, so I think that this could... Again, like barring what happens with Jumpstart for mm-hmm. Historic, could like make a deck there and could make a deck with in uh, Pioneer, mm-hmm. where instead of the like the Saltai mid range deck being kind of like more like grindy, right? This could give it a more aggressive slant if you're like aggressively self milling yourself mm-hmm. and your Uros are also bringing, you know, six power back with them. Right. And it would also just, you know, uh, be able to grind because all of your three ones are just two mana draw a card. Mm-hmm. So, well, I mean, this is also relevant. Like, are you thinking of playing this in Modern Dredge? Modern Dredge is currently built, like, other than Creeping Chill, there's no way it gains life. So, like, yeah, that's true. If you Creeping Chill and get it back, that's great. But you're not like Uro's, like, a repeatable source of life gain out of the graveyard. Yeah, I was just thinking that, well, I mean, you could build the deck differently. Isn't yeah. uh, like Golgari Brown scale, doesn't that gain life when it dredges? It gains two. Oh, it's two. I think it's two. Like, this is interesting with dredge, though, because you can sag it to draw a card. So yeah. you, when it comes back out of your graveyard, you effectively have, like, another dredge. Yeah, you have two mana dredge. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be that, like, the right way to build dredge is it's a instead of being uh, a deck that has red in it for mm-hmm. cathartic reunion and uh, uh, faithful, what well, we used to be faithless looting haggle. Uh, haggle, right. That it might just be like a salt high deck mm-hmm. where you're playing Uro and just it's instead of being like an aggressive deck that's trying to kill you on turn, you know, four. Yeah. It's just trying to like lean more into it's like grind you out plan with mm-hmm. Uro and these kind of things. Yeah. I think this card's interesting. I think it's interesting in Pioneer mm-hmm. uh, is where I first thought it, thought it could go. Anytime you get to get creatures back from for free from the graveyard. Yeah, it's certainly worth another look. It's, it, it's There's usually something there. Yeah. Like Arc Like Phoenix. Right. God Pharaoh's Gift. Yes. Hey, it's, it's Hooded Blight Fang. Yeah, this is another one from Discord. Okay. Uh, two and a black for a 1-4 snake. It has death touch. It says whenever a creature you control with death touch attacks, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. And whenever a creature you control with Dutch death touch deals damage to a planeswalker, destroy that planeswalker. So it has death touch and planeswalker death touch. As a 1-4. As a 1-4. I don't know if we have enough death touch stuff in standard. Yeah. For like Tribal Death Touch, mm-hmm. four mana Veras- Vraska, right? The the uncommon one. Yep. I mean, cares about Death Touch creatures. 
Mm-hmm. And I think we have a couple one one death touchers. And yeah. we have Boot Nipper that I guess guess is a two mana death toucher. Mm-hmm. We've got the uh, the said scorpion, is that it? No, said scorpion yeah. see there's the a greens. green there's a green one. Boss Viper? Maybe. There's a green one, like a one mana one one. Yeah. It could be reasonable, but I don't know if there's enough support. But I think that this card if you like wanted to have like a death touch theme deck is kind of the reason to do it. Yeah. I'm not super high on this card. I think you're being nicer to this card than I would be. Okay. <laughs> not to, uh, you know, blow up anybody's spot or anything. I, I, I'm just not sure what part of this card you're supposed to be excited about. Yeah. Like you said, there's not a ton of support, like death touch creatures that you would play anyway. And like, this isn't a super good payoff for, like filling your deck full of death touchers. Yeah, and usually death touchers are pretty under cost are are underpowered. Yeah. Cause they make up for it with death touch. Right. So like it's not like an aggressive deck and yeah. it's not like the either abilities give you the ability to grind super hard. Right. Right. You're like, you know, it's not like if a death touch creature deals damage, you draw a card. Right. Or something. It's like it's like, yeah. I don't think it's there, but if you want to play, you know, all the death touch things, um, I have to. like I have seen a little bit of hype about this card. Um, there's been a little bit of buzz on Twitter. There's been a little bit of buzz on Reddit. I just don't. I personally don't understand like what the buzz is for. Like I said, there's not really like any single part of this card that's calling out to me or making me excited yeah. to play it. Next up, uh, it's a good boy. It, it, he's the goodest boy. This is a pack leader. This was spoiled, uh, I believe, in the same article where they said that they were changing hounds to dogs. This is a bear, but it's a dog. It's a one and a white for a two-two. Other dogs you control get plus one, plus one. And whenever pack leader attacks, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn to dogs you control. This includes pack leader. It does, because he's a dog. He is. Yeah. But also a bear. Um, right. So I think we said if there are enough dogs for there to be any semblance of a dog deck, mm-hmm. this guy's great. Oh, he is very good. Right? Like the the second part of the text where like prevent all damage. Yeah. Any other like reasonably supported tribe, if they had that as a lord, would mm-hmm. just be ridiculous. Absolutely insane. So I think it's just a question of, are there enough dogs? I don't and know. I have not gone through and looked at all the hounds that are now dogs. Yeah. But there's probably not in standard. Standard usually has a hard time like putting together a tribal deck. Yeah. Maybe this time next year when you have like a full year of new doggies. Them, new dogs cuz i definitely think that they're doing making the change from hound to dog mm-hmm. and then i think they're going to spend the next couple sets putting in dogs probably right there's going to be a lot of things that could have been like a a 22 cat right or a 22 leonin right or that a are just going to be whatever yeah they're just going to be a dog yeah. Because they have this dog tribal support that they're trying to push. Mm-hmm. So right now, I don't think he's there, but I think he could be in the future. Mm-hmm. I think that like people that want to make a dog tribal deck that's like just for fun or kitchen tabley, like they mm-hmm. want pack leader. Yeah. Because if you do a gatherer or a scryfall search for creature type dog, mm-hmm. like you see this and you're like, ooh, ooh I want this yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> Does Kahira work with dogs? Kahira. The green-white companion? Uh, no. No? Because dog was not a creature type. Oh, yeah. Well, that's awkward. Yeah, so Kahira, no good. That's like dinosaurs, nightmares, beasts, yeah. cats, and something else. That stinks. Elementals? I would have liked... For- yeah, it's elementals. Yeah. Like, that would have been good. Yeah. Like that could have been a reasonable like curve of Kahir- of this into Kahira. Mm-hmm. Get in there with your uh, two two vigilance boy. Yep. Uh, but this is a card I think that you can target if it gets cheap. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I think you like buy well, them. At, at, 
I think you nailed it when you said that second ability would make this card busted in any other tribe. Yes. And they're not going to stop printing dogs. They're going to be making dogs for a very long time now. Yes. And I mean, they've been making, do- they've been making hounds forever. Yeah. And for the longest time, hound was kind of a throwaway creature type. Right. Right. Where when they make a zombie or they make a merfolk or an elf, they're making it. And they're thinking about what that card does for that the tribe. tribe. Yeah. Right. Or if it could be used in that tribe. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, they were like, we need a creature type that has no synergies with any of the tribes that we have <laughs> in this set. Hound. Hound. And now they're going to be like, well, nothing else in this set cares about dogs. Right. Can we make this thing a dog and improve the dog deck? Yep. And that if that happens enough, you end up with like, you know, maybe pioneer playable dogs. Maybe. Right. So next up, uh, another dog. Yeah. Selfless sur- or, yes, survivor. Sa- yeah. Savior? Savior. Oh. All right. That's all right. I don't know why I thought this was survivor. It's, hey, Savior. outwit, outlast. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, Words are hard. Yes. Math was hard last week. Uh, words are hard this week. Yeah. So Selfless Savior is a white for a 1-1. One, one. Yep. And you can sacrifice it, and another, and another target creature you control gains indestructible until end of turn. hmm This is Dauntless Bodyguard, which was playable. It was playable because it was a 2-1. And because it was a knight. And because it was a knight. But... Yeah. It was a 2-1, but it oh, could only do the sack, give something indestructible right. if that creature was already on the battlefield. Yeah, and it couldn't change the creatures. Like, it had to stay that creature. Yeah. yeah. This, like, you get to... It can give your best creature whatever you play it indestructible. Mm-hmm. So you play this on turn one, and then you play, you know, Baneslayer Angel on turn five. Baneslayer Angel has indestructible, quote-unquote, right. as long as Selfless Savior is on the battlefield. Right. This is probably going to fit into a mono white, like enchantment boggly deck. Oh, yeah. Because this is another like Alcyed yeah. of Life's Bounty, but you don't have to pay mana to activate. Mm-hmm. And it's also kind of another God's Willing. Instead of giving right. protection, it's giving indestructible. Yep. Or like Fight is one. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's another one of these effects, but it lets you like play it on the installment plan right you yeah. can pay your one mana on turn one and then start putting pants on your thing on turn two and you can tap out right because this is already there to do the work for you yep you don't have to leave mana up every turn like when i played that deck for a little bit and one of the things i found that was kind of annoying was having to leave mana up to protect your guy yeah like turn up to turn and with this you don't have to yeah you just always kind of have it yep um uh- indestructible also pluses and minuses is different than protection yeah so indestructible isn't going to like get damaged through like protection would from god's willing or lcid or whatever but indestructible is also going to save you from a wrath where lcid or god's willing will not yeah so like things that target this is worse Mm -hmm. things that don't target this is better right and the damage the damage getting through like that's this is just stone worse Right. But like yeah, there is there are some subtle differences. Mm-hmm. Also, imagine if Loris was still around. <laughs> indestructible every turn. Every turn. Yeah. Here's my Loris. It is now indestructible. Have yeah. you read the flavor text on this card? I haven't. She raised him from an orphaned pup and gave him a life of love. With his last act, he thanked her. Oh, he's the goodest boy. Yeah. Yeah, take that pack leader. Yeah. He's better than you. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of pack leader though, this is a reasonable dog. Like how it many is. how many reasonable like I think we still need a threat, like a doggy threat. Yeah. Like but. you need like a like a powerful three mana like aggro dog or something. What about isn't there a four mana make four dogs? That's a jump start card. Oh, that's a jump start? That's not a core twenty one card. Yeah, that's a jump release mm. the dogs. Is that what it's called? Yes. Okay. 
I'm sure the playtest name was Who Let the Dogs Out, but they could, not, they could not do that. <laughs> the flavor text should just be Who, Who, Who. That should just be like, on the actual card, the flavor text should just be Who, Who, Who. who, 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 who. Yeah. Scavenging news. Oh, near and dear to my heart. So, um, card is great. It is. Uh, multi-format all-star. This is, if you don't know, it's one and a green for a 2-2. Two, two. It's an ooze. You can pay a green, exile a card from a graveyard, any card from any graveyard. If it was a creature, you put a plus one, plus one counter on scavenging ooze, and you gain a life. So this, this is... card is fantastic in mid-range decks for, you know, building a threat over time, a little bit of incidental life gain, and, like, selectively nuking your opponent's graveyard. It's one of the best creatures in modern Jund. It sees play in Pioneer, in the Sultai decks. It will 100% see play in all of the mid-range green slog that is standard. Yeah, it's a question of, is standard small enough for this? Right. Right. But this does, like, can be main deckable. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a sideboardable card Mm -hmm. because if your opponent's an Uro deck... Right. Right. Like you play a scavenging ooze. If they play an Uro, you just eat it. It loses right. that recursive ability. Mm-hmm. Or you just manage their graveyard around their Uro. Right. And you never let their Uro, you never get enough cards in their graveyard for the Uro to matter. Mm-hmm. So, like, it can kind of shut off that avenue of attack from the, like, the Bant and the Saltai ramp decks. Mm-hmm. But it's just a question of, like, are they going to go too far over the top? for him to like really matter yeah i don't know yeah but i think that like against mono red out of the sideboard this card gains you some life and gets to be a big threat that they can't get through yeah against like i said against the the uro decks it's going to eat an uro or keep the graveyard small mm-hmm. it's going to do all these little things that you don't realize the card does right but it's a swiss army knife yes it'll it does a lot it can be a six six that wins the game yep so this card is good. Uh, the alternate art is pretty sick. Yeah, it's awesome. I feel bad because at the last Grand Prix that we went to, I bought some M14 foils, and now I need to get rid of some M14 foils. <laughs> yeah. Because I need some of this extended art in my life. Yeah, it is very good. Next up, Lana War Visionary. Yeah, what's this guy? It's two elves in a trench coat. It is It is exactly two elves in a trench coat. So it is two and a green for a 2-2. Two, two, mm-hmm. A creature elf druid. When it comes into play, you draw a card and you tap it for a green. It's so a, it's Llanowar Elf and Elvish Visionary. Stuck together. That's yep. the name Llanowar Visionary. <laughs> Real creative there, guys. Real creative, guys. I think the card is fine. I think if you are a historic player... With all the elves, they just printed into Historic through Jumpstart. Yeah. Right. This definitely has a home there. Did um, Shaman of the Pack get a reprint? I don't think, but they printed Dwanin's Elite, uh, Elvish Arch Druid. Yeah. And the new one drop. And the new one drop. And then this are all yeah. in, are all going to be in Historic. Plus, yeah. we have one, one mana elf right now. In Historic? historic you don't have both of them no oh, no i guess we don't mystic, have mystic mystic was 15 yeah we do have a clan caller though right yes so like there is definitely like this is has mystic a and jumpstart not that i've seen oh i mean it would make sense if it was yeah this card is gonna go into a small format elf deck mm-hmm. like i don't think it can push into modern yeah but, no, there's no room in modern modern elves for this. Yeah, but in like pioneer or historic, this probably has a home, mm-hmm. and it's just a generally good card. Like it does what modern cards have to do, right? Right. Or what basically all the ramp they've printed for the last like two <laughs> years does. It draws, it draws you, you a, card a card and ramps you. Yeah. Like you keep a hand of all ramp, and you're like, yeah. oh, I guess I'll see seven new cards before I have to worry about casting my uh, threat. Yeah. And I'll find my threat. Yeah. Back in my day, all of your all of your ramp just 
ramped you. Right. And you were like, oh man, I really hope this rampant growth gets the land out of my deck and I have a slightly <laughs> higher chance of drawing my threat. Yeah. Not just like, oh, I'm going to just draw cards and I'll find yeah. it. Back in my day, explosive vegetation only got you two lands. It didn't also cycle when you didn't need it to get you two lands. Yeah. This card's great, like, for limited, too, though, right? Oh, yeah, I think like, for sure. Like, it's just a slam dunk and limited. Yeah, like, any any uh, any creature that replaces itself is good, and the fact that this yeah. also ramps you yep. is is kind of absurd. Like, think about how good, like, uh, Cloudkin Seer was. Yeah. This is, like, a Cloudkin Seer... We take off flying, we give it an extra point of toughness, and it taps for mana? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Seems well balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurian Dryad. This is an old school card. This used to be like a vintage playable card. It was legacy playable too. This is one on a green for a 1-1. One, one. And you're mm -hmm. like, are you guys high? How is this playable <laughs> in anything? Whenever you cast a spell that is white, blue, black, or red... Put a plus one, plus one counter on Korean Dryad. So anything that's not green. Yeah. So basically, there was a type of deck called uh, Xerox, mm -hmm. which was you just cast a bunch of like cantrips and went through your deck mm -hmm. and put counters on this and uh, a card we talked about earlier, sometimes a lore scale coaddle. Yep. Right. So you just all these creatures that wanted you to cast spells or draw cards, you just played them and they got huge. Mm -hmm. This probably supports that kind of archetype or something similar in Limited. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's something good enough in Constructed for it. Yeah, I don't think so. I think this randomly also saw play like in some of the early Rug Delver decks. I think so. Yeah, remember, uh, is it Deep Root Elite? Mm-hmm. Like yeah, the one one that like, version of this that didn't do anything, right? Yeah, that didn't do anything. Yeah, it was like a rare. Yeah, yeah. I think this card is is interesting. Like it does have like a history of being played, but that history was ten or fifteen years ago. Yeah, before creatures were good. Before creatures were good, like make your own six six, and now <laughs> it's just like pay three mana, get a six six. Get a six six. Draw you cards. Cool. Gain you life. Also cool. <laughs> All right. Spark Hunter Master Core. Mm -hmm. So this is three mana for a three four. Yep. And it has the Master Core downside. Right. Which is as an additional cost to cast a spell, discard a card. Okay. That's a pretty big downside. That is a pretty big downside. But it gets protection from Planeswalkers. Oh, so you can't Teferi bounce it. Can't Teferi bounce it. Passes the Teferi test. Yep. It deals one damage. It pay one and it deals one damage to target Planeswalker. That's pretty good. So it just kind of eats Planeswalkers. Yep, machine guns them down. And you can pay three mana, and it'll gain indestructible to end of turn. Okay. I think that, one, the fact that kind of survives Teferi is important. Mm -hmm. It's very um, important. I've heard different people talk about the fact that the discarding a card might not be as big a downside in current standard. Because when a you're lot trying of, to escape. Well, when you're trying to escape, or you're just... A lot of games in standard, you have a lot of cards in your hand. Yeah. Right, because you're arrowing and grow spiraling, like all your cards are cantrips. Right. So you never really are down a card. So like it's not as big a deal. Like if you were playing a normal standard mm -hmm. where, you know, on turn three you might have five cards in your hand. Yeah. Right. This is a lot bigger deal than now. It's like you have seven cards in your hand. It's just what you do. Yeah. This could be like a cyborg card against like controlling decks that are planeswalker heavy. Mm -hmm. right, that are going to rely on uh, three mana to ferry to kind of control board. the board. Yeah. yeah. The indestructible ability just costs too much. Yeah, I think so too. Right. If it was like one, right, then you would have the like the play pattern of like on turn four, you could play Spark Hunter Master Core mm -hmm. and have up one mana for to give it indestructible to play around like a Shadow of the Sky. Right. But now you don't have that kind of play pattern. I think even two mana would make it. Like, okay, three mana is just too much, though. Yeah, it's just it's just a little too much to have to hold that up. Yeah. It's interesting. It's a type of protection we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And kind of feel like this card might be good just because they're trying to print a lot more cards that interact with Planeswalkers. Yeah. And, like, this You mean after like, the set that had 30-something Planeswalkers in it? And they had no good ways to kill them? Yeah. 
yeah, after that set, yeah. they they thought a year later, maybe we should like adjust. Yeah. I will say though that like the fact that they've tacked or planeswalker mm-hmm. on a bunch of cards in this set that normally wouldn't have that ability. Right. I think shows that they are listening to people mm-hmm. that are like, you can't just give me Doomblade when my opponents only play Planeswalkers. Right. Right. I have to play Doomblade because of Embercleave mm-hmm. and Mono Red. But then there are just times where my Doomblade does stone nothing and I get yeah. buried. Yeah. So you have to give me a card that lets me deal with both. Mm-hmm. And we don't have it on our list, but that's uh, Eliminate. Right. The one in the black kill a creature, convert a mana cost, kill a creature or planeswalker, CMC three or less. Mm-hmm. Like that's not a kind of card we've like seen. It's just like purely like black, yeah. like, you know, two mana. And then the the new flaying tendrils or whatever it's, I don't know what it's called. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. One black, black, all creatures get neg two, neg two, or, or remove the lo- two loyalty counters from planeswalkers. Yeah. Right. Like that's, not a card we've ever seen anything like. Yeah. And I think that's a response to War of the Spark. It just takes a year in development to get those responses made. Yeah. Now, War is leaving in September, right? It is. Yay, no more little Teferi. Yeah. It's kind of strange that we're getting all these, like, Planeswalker hate cards with only, like, three months left in this standard. Yeah. I but wonder I re- if we're, they're going to do another Planeswalker set. Please, no. Yeah. I really, I it might just be that they didn't realize how good the Planeswalkers were. Mm-hmm. And then people were complaining about them and this was the first time they could get the answers into standard. That might be also. And also, like, this format's supposed to have Oko. Yeah. Well, I mean, this kind of answers Oko, right? It does not become an elk. It does not become an elk. You have to dump all your mana into it on turn four and turn five. <laughs> And I think you kill an Oko. Yeah. I'm not a hundred percent. You might have to be on the play for that to be true. <laughs> Cause like he went up to five. Yeah. So, okay. Now I put him at two and if they don't have a blocker, you get to kill the Oko. Yep. If they have a blocker, he goes up to four. You have to spend your entire next turn. <laughs> Cause they definitely have an Oko, uh, a blocker then because they turned their food into a three, three. So you only had to play like four mana or three mana the next turn. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It also blocks a Gideon. It does. You're right. <laughs> Just boom. Block. I don't know when the last time somebody played, played a Gideon against me, but. This does take care of a Gideon. Yeah. But like eliminate would, you know, is good against like, you know, Oko if it was still a card in the yeah. format. Gideon on your turn, Teferi, yeah. Narset. Like it fills a need. Yep. So it is good that they have like listened to people that were like, this is awful. Mm-hmm. All right. Next up. Nine lives. Yep. Meow. Meow. So I asked for this card. You did. Because this card is some percentage of Phyrexian Unlife. It is. And in Pioneer, Solemnity is legal. It is. So. Nine lives is one white white for an enchantment that is hexproof. If a source would deal you damage, prevent that damage and put an incarnation counter on nine lives. So it doesn't matter if you got dealt one damage or one million damage, Mm -hmm. one counter goes on nine lives. Right. One life gone. One life gone. When there are nine or more incarnation counters on nine lives, exile it. And then when nine lives leaves the battlefield, you lose the game. Mm-hmm. So, Solemnity is two and a white. Permanents can't get counters. Permanents and players, but permanents yep. can't get counters. So, if you go nine lives into Solemnity, you just can't take damage until they remove your enchantment. Right. And this one has hex proof. And this one has hex proof. So, they have to remove the Solemnity. Yep. Now, you are weak to, like, if plain air cleansing or. Is it? Yeah. I forget. What, it's not return to nature. Back uh, to nature? Back. They, they, they just. One in a green, destroy all enchantments? Yeah. So yeah. something like that, like, you know, it's been fun. Yeah. But. GG's. GG's. 
and you have a buffer. Like if they only have like one threat, mm. you can nine lives and like get hit a couple times before you draw your solemnity. Yeah, you can kind of last ditch cast it. This is bad against go wide strategies, right? Yeah. If they have five one ones, yeah, it takes half your of your nine lives, mm-hmm. and then you just die the next turn. Uh, but it does combo well with with solemnity and could lead to like some sort of like white prison type strategy Mm -hmm. where you like just are like mono three drops so when we first started talking about this card you were comparing it to phyrexian unlife yes which is used in a very different deck than a prisony yes white card so is there anything like you would use to phyrexian unlife for that we can use this for so unlife it's like you can't lose like you can't lose the no what is it it's not can't lose the game right having less than one life doesn't cause you to lose the game right and damage is dealt in poison counters as long as you have zero or less life yeah yeah so what that allows you to do is to pay life yeah because life is not damage because it's where like damage gives you poison counters right so you pay a bunch of life so i don't know i guess this is also deal damage so like oh and this doesn't stop you from from losing yeah this just stops damage loss of life isn't damage okay so you could still pay life yeah and not uh and not have this accrue a counter right so i can't think of anything that we like pay life for and like recent sets. right but this doesn't stop you from losing the game true oh yeah true so you can't go to like negative 50 what right. you came with for and on life right yes yeah, so correct and on life is having less than zero life does not lose you the game right yeah so if you were dealing yourself damage in big chunks in big chunks or again you had solemnity and some way to do yourself damage that you could like you know if it was like you know lose three life is command the dread horde damage or loss of life i think it's damage but i'm not sure well then that's pretty cute yeah that could be interesting yeah i was thinking more of like prisoning strategy yeah like a worship kind of thing yeah kind of like a a build your own worship yeah that's the thought process there uh Mm -hmm. why this could be i don't think it has a home in standard or anything yeah i don't think so all right. Next. Up. Did you did you notice that the uh, the things in the background there? There's Savannah Lions. There's uh, M- M- what's her name? Miri. Miri. Yeah. A Johnny. A Johnny. Um, a Johnny's brother. I didn't know Johnny had a brother. Yeah, something with a J, I think. Okay. Just yeah, Johnny. I I no, it's. I don't know. He's a commander card. Okay. I don't know if you knew they were actually like. There no, they're actually characters. Yeah. There's like eight of them, and then this cat. Right. Makes nine. Yeah. So. I think a Johnny'd be pissed if he turned into that cat, though. <laughs> <laughs> but he would have both eyes. This is true, but he wouldn't have Elspeth's cape. True. I or didn't know he had, I giant didn't know he, axe. I didn't know he had uh, Elspeth's cape. So. Yeah, like the cape that he's always wearing is Elspeth's. I did not realize that. Yeah. Man. I'm not teach de- you everything. I'm not deep in the lore, man. <laughs> I mean, maybe Elspeth watched The Incredibles and was like, no capes. <laughs> and it was like, capes. here, trying to take my cape. <laughs> <laughs> I've sworn off capes now. Next up, I, this was a last minute edition. I already flipped floor, so you've already seen it, but. Spoiler alert. Ugin the Spirit Dragon. Big Daddy Ugin. This is the thing to ramp into like you know 100 yeah, percent. Prob- probably like two of in a lot of ramp decks yep we used to ramp into age and a treachery now we ramp into ugin we didn't ramp into age and a treachery we we cheated it into play no we ramped into age oh, and a treachery once ramped- upon a time this is true we yeah. played good fair magic yeah where we where we cast seven drops on turn five <laughs> other people were like no we're going to free. not do that free Want to pay no mana for this. Yeah. Ugin can just kind of be like the big end game for the format. Yeah. 
it protects itself really well with the uh, neg ability neg x yeah. it uh exiles every non-colored permanent with cmc x or less so it just clears the board ticks up super quick dealing damage on its way up and then like if your game somehow survives to his ult his ult wins you the game yeah which is you gain seven you draw seven and then yeah. you put up to seven permanents from your hand onto the battlefield yep and for those of you who don't know, it's kind of the opposite of the Nickel Bolas Planeswalker, the original Bolas the original Planeswalker. One. Yeah. Which is like your opponent loses seven, discard seven, and sack seven permanents or something. Yep. Card's good. Really good. It's just going to be the thing that you ramp into. So things to remember, I think you brought this up before, Nissa lands are colorless. They are. You can play Nissa and then you could clear her away, but the lands stay. Mm-hmm. He does have a blind spot to... Uh, it's like sport sorcerer spyglass. Yeah. Right? Like you spyglass him and or if something else is spyglass, you can't he can't get a spyglass. Right. Spyglass might be slightly more playable if we're ramming into Ugans. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but I wanted to put this one on here because this is the big headliner from the set, and it's definitely gonna see play. Yeah, and the uh extended art and alt art versions or whatever are gonna be worth a fortune, so if yeah. you see them, good luck. Hold on, yes. Yeah. I think that's all the cards from the set. I think so. I don't think we missed anything. Whole episode. No, yeah. I don't think we missed too much. I mean, we could talk about every card in the set if we really wanted to, but I think I'm we, sleepy. Yeah, me too. I think we caught most of the heavy hitters, and we caught everything that anybody had asked for on Discord. I think we did a pretty good job. Yeah. So... So yeah, let's get us back to being like visible people. Hi, Ooh, people. Hey. So with Sit that, with <laughs> yeah. With that, I think that's our show. Yeah. If you want to tweet at us uh, what you're excited about, if you think we missed something, get at us at Casual Tripod on Twitter. Yep. You can find us on Facebook at Casual Tryhard MTG. Uh, shoot, shoot us a message there, and you can yell at me about how good Hooded Blightfang is after I said it was unplayable. <laughs> Uh, you can also shoot us an email show at casual tryhard mtg.com don't forget about our tcg affiliate link tcg.casualtryhardmtg.com uh, they have pre-orders up for all the core 21 cards if you want to pre-order something uh, you sent me an article right before we started recording about maybe some pre-sale specs yeah prices were low on some cards right now um, that article is from tcg player so if you want to head over there and check out that article and then uh, maybe order some cards. That was a part two. Yeah. I kind of scanned part one, and they kind of went over some price histories from the last couple core sets mm-hmm. for you to look at, like what the cards did long term. So, yeah. so check that article out. Um, like I said, if you're going to buy any specs or anything else, uh, use that link, and we'll get a very small sliver of whatever you spend there. Helps to keep the show going. Um, if you wanted to support us a little bit more directly, don't forget about our Patreon, patreon.com slash casual tryhard MTG. We don't have too many perks, but we do have the uh, finance room in our Discord server. You are going to get to see our beautiful faces chatting before this episode. We'll yeah. post that up there. Um, we did a little, little bit about last week's episode, a little bit before the episode that we threw up on Patreon. So if you're a Patreon, head over there and check that out. If you would like to hear or see some of that, you can head over there, sign up to be a patron. Hope the show out. Do we have anything else going on? I don't think so. Um, bear with our, you know, subpar, not our normal production uh, quality for this episode. It's kind of hard to be locked into a small studio. Yeah. Uh, in, in these trying times. Right. And uh, the guy that normally does, our friend Juan, that normally does the cards and you know, makes everything look pretty with the backgrounds or whatever he's tied up this week. So we were on our own this week. So yeah, this is my man cave behind me. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, this is my loft. So you yeah. can't see everything else, but there's big open behind me. Yes. There's about a 20 foot drop behind me. Ooh, dangerous. Ooh. Good thing I don't have a cat that we can flicking things off. Oh no. <laughs> we're jumping down, God forbid. Oh yeah, don't do that. Bad idea. And with that, I think that's the show, and we will see you on the internet. Yep, we'll catch you guys in Discord. 